Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's very, very pleased to be here. Um, uh, I'm going to talk about BIM. Uh, we'll argue about what that means later on. I'm going to talk about digitalisation and what the Construction Products Association in the UK is doing. Um, does that work? Yes, brilliant. Just very quickly, uh, the Construction Products Association in the UK, we represent uh, around 85% of product manufacturers in the UK, uh, and that's around 300, 313,000 jobs. So a fairly, a fairly big sector for the UK, about 50 billion. Um, and we're very pleased that we have a very active membership, um, and most of them are all interested in BIM, which is, which is great. Now, the, the question that I'm going to pose to you in this slot is about the construction puzzle. Um, we have a situation where lots of things go on in construction, lots of uncoordinated things, lots of things which are meant to happen, but actually, at the end of the day, they, they probably don't. It, it's a case of making sense of this to achieve the buildings and the outcomes that we want, uh, and that really hardly ever happens. We always have a situation where chaos reigns at some point in the production. So how do we make this work better? That's the challenge of digitalization. Currently, in the UK industry, we draw every project two and a half times and we construct it one and a half times. That's a ridiculous amount of waste and it's something that we need to address. And it's something I think that digitalization, rather than BIM, because it's a wider subject, will actually tackle and get us to a good solution. We are taking the initiative from other industries. The car industry and the aviation industry long ago in the 70s considered that if they put the design in a computer, if they test it in a computer, if they emulate everything they can possibly do, but most of all, if they actually manufacture it in the computer and assemble it in the computer, we take the bugs out, we take the problems away, and we can achieve reliability, and that's the aviation and car industry that we've got today, so why not buildings? Very straightforward proposition, really. The, the key thing, though, is that certainly in the UK, and I think across Europe, we have a siloed industry, and that's the thing that generates the confusion. We have, we have pockets of designers, pockets of procurers, pockets of contractors, and pockets of clients. And rarely do they talk on a meaningful level. Rarely do they communicate all the way through the project. So that silo mentality has got to be broken down. About 10 years ago in the UK, we started to consider what we could do about that silo problem. On the screen now, there is a plethora of documents and reports. Um, we're all used to those, endlessly reading them. Um, and I've got another one for you at the end of this talk, actually. But that shows the progression from top left, around in a circle, um, of the key documents that were published to, to get us on the road, to get us from a point of an industry which wasn't quite certain whether it should adopt any form of electronic work at all, into an industry which is now actually moving to full digitalization. And, and that's a key element for the, for the way we have progressed and, and gone forward. Each of those reports has taken us a step further to a completely integrated platform across the UK. We mapped it out, and, and I hope a few of you have seen this diagram before. We mapped it out in terms of this ramp diagram, as it's called. Um, starting on the extreme left, we're talking about paper, drawings, uncoordinated projects, very, very traditional ways of working. Um, and we started to chart the, the potential of moving into a fully digitalized, fully integrated industry. In order to do that, the, the principle was to set out a number of, a number of levels. So we, we have there, um, in, in that diagram as it's an early one, they're, they're called phases, but they soon morphed into levels. We have level naught, level one, level two, level three. The goal was set by the UK government to achieve general working on government projects at level two by last autumn. And there was an earlier, there was an earlier deadline of last uh, eight, April 2016. That was sort of achieved, but it was never going to be achieved fully because this is a big revolution. This, this, is, this is on par with the other revolutions I would suggest that, that we've talked about earlier. But the, but the key is to get everybody interested in what does this mean? What does working at level two actually mean? A common thing right across the industry now. 
but it means that everybody's engaged. It's got their attention. It's moving things forward in the right direction. We are now working very heavily to make sure that level two is embedded, and we're also working on what does level three mean. And effectively, level three is that future revolution that Tim talked about, everything joined up, everything <laughs> talking to itself, and possibly a load of machines that are much more intelligent than the rest of us. Um, and whether that's good or bad, we will wait to see in the future. But nonetheless, the game is on. If we take that diagram and add a little bit more detail, and possibly, I'm afraid, you won't be able to see it uh, right at the back, but the lines at the bottom of the diagram are the supporting standards that were put in place in order to make this achievable. The issue there is clearly when somebody is asked to make a step forward to join a revolution, you say, well, how am I going to do that? And by putting in a whole load of, of standards, uh, the 1192 family, as it's become, become known, um, those start to organise people's actions, start to organise the way they will approach projects. Those same standards are now being rewritten into SEND standards, and they're now also being rewritten into ISO standards. So that, that starting journey is now starting to spread outwards from the UK, um, and I know colleagues around the room, um, everybody's interested in exactly how we take this forward using those standards. Part of this story is about how every building has a natural chronology. And that chronology is probably best expressed in the RIBA digital plan of work that's up behind me. That breaks down every project in, into basically eight stages. And those stages are crucial for the development running through from the initial inception that the client lays down right the way through to occupation and use. That Taking that standard and then applying it to a digital platform, we see this diagram, which is one of the early ones from PAS 1192-2, which was the first clear standard on how BIM should operate in the UK. Draw your attention to the central bit, which is the, the, the triangles there. That's composed of three elements. Those three elements are the 3D graphical emulation of the building. The cent central bit is around the, the digital information, which is crucial in this process. And the third bit is the legal uh, and necessary paperwork we have to have at this stage. We haven't quite moved on where everything is joined up electronically. But the key thing to, to demonstrate at that point is the fact that BIM is not about CAD. It's not about 3D images. It's about data first and foremost. The data supports the 3D images, and that is so important because it is the data that brings reliability, it's the data that joins up all the players in the conversation, it's the data that gives us sense in terms of what will actually be built reliably, reliably and in improved performance and with better health and safety and all those aspects that we're trying to drive for. If I just focus a little bit, there's a thing called COBE, which some of you might have heard of. It came out of the States. It was a, it was a way of actually organizing this data and making sure that it was, it was a, adaptable and usable in construction and fit for purpose. So what effectively we have is, is a process of joining up the, the 3D graphic with the necessary legal documentation and that all-important data set. And in future, I'm sure that buildings and projects will be defined totally on the data. We'll use the 3D graphics more as an illustration uh, and a suggestion of what we're going to do. This is to do with the sophistication of the software that we're actually using, and the journey is really still on in how that works. Other advances that have taken this forward is the thing called the MBS BIM Toolkit, which, which seeks to take that data and organise it through those stages of the project. This is an example of how that works. So at the early stages, you want to say, I want a radiator, and I want it in that position in that room. We're not really fussed on what it is. That's an early stage piece of data, so it's very, very simple. So we don't actually overload everybody with lots of information. Moving forward in the process, though, we will want to add data. We will want to add a level of detail and a level of information, as it's called, and this particular software takes the designers and takes the client through that journey. 
this is, this is an early stage, really, of this process, and it will get more sophisticated, and we will start to develop things further. I'm highlighting that ramp diagram again and showing you that the key bit, the data, runs right through the middle of it, and that is so important. If, if, if you take away one thing from this particular slot, that is BIM equals data. That's the most important issue. What are, the, uh, what are the CPA actually doing about this? Because the, the key issue going forward is that a lot of clients, a lot of designers have, have joined up with the BIM uh, movement, um, and a lot of that has been running for quite some time. The issue that's been missing is to join up product data. So the, the, uh, the, the Construction Products Association have collaborated with a number of key stakeholders, and we are starting to work on it on two projects. One is Lexicon, which I'll come on to in a minute, and the other is uh, Digital Object Indicators. We've teamed up with MBS, who did the toolkit, and we've teamed up with British Standards. And we've come up with the, the Object Indicator. Now, the, the short form uh, to tell, every, tell you all is that this is the ISBN number for building products. So for all time, a manufacturer can register an index which will take you back to an international registry for that same product. So never again are you running around trying to find out what sort of light bulb that is because you can identify it straight away. This supports the whole of the BIM movement, i.e. we have reliability, we have certainty in terms of which product we're talking about. So often products are substituted during construction or indeed products are just go out of production. So therefore, we need a, a process like this to make sure that we are talking the same language about the same products. And the digital object indicator will, will surely do that. We are intending to launch this in the autumn, um, and it will be a commercial system, but nonetheless with lots of interest from all our members over how it will work. Quick, quick illustration. This is the chaotic uh, arena, if you like, in terms of, of how product information is passed around certainly in the UK industry, but that's, that's probably the same for Europe as well. And then after we introduce a um, digital object indicator, this probably it looks just as complicated, but I assure you it's a lot more straightforward and a lot more accurate and more reliable. Um, I'll quickly now come on to our lexicon project. Um, and this is, this is a, a, a journey we've, we've been on for at least a couple of years. And what this is trying to do, as I said, is bring together um, product information and make it machine readable and make it consistent across all projects. This diagram uh, on the screen uh, attempts to show uh, just uh, what the difference in that process is likely to be. Um, last spring, we published this document, uh, which was primarily written by Steve Thompson. I'm going to embarrass him now and say it, it was a really good job. Um, that uh, standard is now being turned into PAS 1192 uh, 7, um, and we hope that it will be the, the basis of, of uh, product data going forward. So now, the, the issue with um, product data that Lexicon addresses is how to make sure that all products use the same language uh, and hence can be machine readable and how are all projects described in their, in their data set, in that all important data. Um, and this is an is a analysis of how we start to break that down and we start to identify what are the common factors and I suspect that is far too small for you to read. So basically this project has been running now for a little over a year, we are on the edge of, of the launch um, of the software. And what that will do is we will be able to allow all the companies uh, in the Construction Products Association first to trial it, and then the rest of the industry to take it on. And what this will mean for them is that they can start to have common, common uh, definitions for things like length and height and width and density. Uh, we can then have common data templates which are machine readable across whole sectors and it basically means that products then join the rest of the revolution within the BIM world and we hope therefore it will, it will go on and start to create a real movement. Now, um, one of the mechanisms that we are going to use is to join together sectors of the industry and call them relevant authorities. Who best to decide 
on the definitions and the data templates than parts of industry itself. So that whole mechanism is going to be available on our website uh, and we're going to encourage and we've already got lots of people interested, lots of organisations who are, who are actually beating down my door to come and uh, do this and get on with it. So we're hopeful in the next few weeks this is going to, this is going to be launched and I'm afraid this, these slides are too wordy for you, for you to see so I'm going to skip by them. Um, again, putting a relevant authority together, this is the process that we're going to use to make sure that everybody has a level playing field, make sure we, we do not get into market squabbles and, and disputes to make sure that, that we have sense and clear data. I just also, though, wanted to look at the future because other speakers have done it as well. From my vice perspective, I think, yes, drones are essential for the future of construction. We already have a load of projects in, in the UK that have been set out and controlled using drones. We've, we've got uh, virtual reality and augmented reality, and those are the things that I think are going to be used on site uh, very soon, actually, and linking straight back to the BIM model uh, so that we can ensure that what we build is actually as accurate as we can get it before the machines arrive, that, anyway. Um, and lastly, I just want to say that, that to follow up on this, we actually have a, a report, which is a free download off of our website, which is called The Future um, for Construction Product Manufacturing. Again, a lot of it authored by Steve. Um, and that takes you into a much more detailed, much longer journey than I've got time for and explains some of the detailed concepts that we think are going to emerge in this, in this area. And that's me. Thank you very much. <laughs>